Hi, everyone. So, um, my name is Tom Vigier. I work at uh, Andarta Pictures as a TD. So, uh, Andarta is a French 2D animation studio created by Sophie Saget and based in the south of France, creating adventure stories and exciting worlds to, to help kids grow. Andarta develops uh, its own projects, but uh, also offers 2D animation production services. So I will quickly show you the latest demo of the studio so you can see what we do. Okay. So it's not working. <laughs> there. My journey with Andarta started in 2018, right after the very beginning of the studio, working as 2D animator on rigor. Pretty quickly, I became the tech art guy, jumping in on different projects, whether it was at head of rigging, animation lead, or later on as technical director, or even director. I also did some work for other studios here and there, but it was at uh, Andarta where I really got a full view of how a 2D animated series get made. As for A Will and Quest, it's been around since day one, literally the first project of the studio. You could almost say that uh, Andarta Pictures was born when Sophie got the rights to adapt the story, this story into animation. So here's the pitch. At just 13, Camille's life takes a dramatic turn when she accidentally gets cast into the world of Gwendalavir, inhabited by creatures, uh, creatures as extraordinary as they are dangerous. With her friend Salim, she discovers her real name, Ewilan, and learns the truth about her roots and her fate, a native of Gwendalavir. She has inherited a prodigious talent, drawing, which turns out to be a decisive weapon in her people's struggle with the terrible Tzlish. Ewilan's arrival brings fresh hope for saving an embattled world, and imagination will be her only limit. So after a long period of graphic research and story development, the first teaser came out in 2020, co-directed by Slim Ananis and François-Marc Bayet. Uh, here it is.
So around that time, during a production slowdown, Sophie encouraged me to dive into Blender. At that time, version 2.8 had just come out and everyone was talking about the grease pencil. So I signed up for a two-week online Blender course at the studio and seeing how excited I was, um, she allowed me to continue for several months to really, really dig into this incredibly powerful software. So I started exploring, testing different add-ons, watching examples. I watched almost every YouTube video out there or, um, at this time on 2D animation and rigging in Blender. I did a lot of testing at first on personal projects, some animation, storyboarding, and then gradually more on Ewilam. So it was really an exciting time, diving deep into all the possibilities this blend of 2D and 3D could offer. So here's a little video of some of the tests. So at first I was testing traditional animation, trying out simple rigging on the character's heads, seeing, uh, yes, seeing how 3D could save time when drawing complex things. So on this shot, for example, uh, I reused the background from the teaser, experimented with compositing and camera mapping, pushed the rigging a bit further and worked with background artist um, Stefano Aneto to create more complex environments like this one. And finally, I started tackling really challenging stuff, things you wouldn't normally dare to do in 2D animation, just to see how far we could push the limits. So this shot was really tough anyway, never finished it because I understood that Hard animation takes time, so easy learning. But overall, it was a really fun time. It was both really exotic and different from what I was used to, but um, it was exciting to see the power and potential of the toolbox. At this point, I didn't know much about coding. I started sharing all my tools ID, script ID with Mark, um, who is there today, my colleague at uh, IT and development, suggesting things like, can we do this? Could we script that? So he was smart enough to encourage me to run Python instead. And I decided to dive into Python and explore the Blender API. So I have to say that I was pretty impressed by my own learning curve in both Python and Blender API because it's pretty well documented and the community platforms like Blender Stack Overflow are really active and really people are really happy to help you. So even just before the arrival of AI support for coding, I, it was very a good way to start programming. I should add that being both the developer and the user of the tools saves a lot of time. So by the end of that period, I published a few add-ons, uh, simple tools for traditional animation, like uh, initial onion skin tool, uh, workarounds for the dope sheets that you will see just later managing grease pencil frames, uh, and even weird experiment to generate uh, in-betweens with uh, AI. So I also started working on some unpublished uh, add-ons that started to think about cutout animation, masking, uh, and more. So the choice to go completely open source came naturally from the start. All of our code is public on GitLab. I'm sure most of, you, uh, most of you know already the benefits of open source, but to me it's also because when we're mainly sharing ideas, proofs of concepts, even hacks and workarounds, that really benefit from being publicly accessible and discussed. We don't claim to set any standard uh, for 2D animation method in Blender on our own, but we want to participate and sharing workflows between studios, make them also kind of share the training costs because artists move from a studio to another. So of course, not everything is well documented. Some tools are really specific to certain projects, uh, but feel free to try them out, improve them, suggest new ideas, or just reach out and show your interest. We aim to keep this project as collaborative as possible. So a, a few years later, uh, Ewinon's Quest was finally nearing the end of the road to securing funding for a series. You can see that the art direction changed a lot quite lately. That's when the question came up, can we actually make Ewilan in Blender? So I was really enthusiastic about it, but I have to admit it was a bold move. With all the development, uh, development we wanted to implement, we needed a major project to justify it. A short movie wouldn't, would have been less risky, of course, but its economy wouldn't support that much development work. And we wouldn't impose an experimental pipeline on a client uh, with a service project. So here we were, ready to start the Studio Slack chip project in Blender. 
From that point on, I wasn't uh, alone anymore. With support from CNC, um, I was joined by talented artists and developers, including uh, Lionel Charmet, Pierre Etev, and uh, Martin Cuinet with the fancy keyboard. Um, we spent months building a pipeline, developing tools, testing them, and making improvements. So it's really not easy to change the habits of artists and technicians, getting them to buy into a new method and relearn how to work. At the beginning, this was one of the big challenges we came across. Nobody wants to invest that much energy into a change if they have nothing to gain. We needed to, we needed to show tangible benefits for the artist or for the project as a whole. One of our goals uh, was to use as few software as possible, unlike the Willian teaser you saw, which involved at least five different programs and required exporting between each. So we aim to convince as many departments as possible to dive into Blender. So you can see on screen um, our latest series of tests, complete uh, test sequence from storyboarding to compositing, even the involving the lead team. The asset design, rigging, layout, posing, and animation were all done directly into Blender. However, we still had to use uh, other software for storyboarding, background painting, and compositing, either due to technical limitations or more human reasons. So right after this sequence, the production kicked off, and of course, we weren't uh, completely ready. But uh, I'm pretty sure you never can be fully ready, fully prepared until you face the realities of production. So even today, we're still developing and fine-tuning everything as we go along, all while addressing the needs of artists, demands of production. So it's definitely not easy, but we are proud that the project is underway, and I'm happy to share a bit of this workflow with you today. We're actually making it in Blender. This one is the animation, and will be followed by the comp. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, a few bad news first. Uh, when we started development, Respen Steel was just beginning its refactor, so we didn't really have any visibility on when it would be released or how stable it would be. So, we quickly decided to stick to version 3.6. Unfortunately, all the add-ons you'll see today uh, were not tested at all on the latest version of Blender. Of Blender. Um, we don't have enough time right now to even think about adapting our tools for Blender 4 and GPV3. So I hope we will do that sooner or later, sorting out what's still relevant and what isn't. The possibilities of uh, hybridization in Blender are truly incredible. It's really easy to get lost uh, in them, especially with a 2D mindset. Just like drawing a, making a flat drawing and spinning around uh, with the, in the 3D view doesn't serve any purpose, but it's already super cool. <laughs> so, then when you start thinking you can draw in volume or animate uh, in 2D in a 3D environment, allowing for more complex camera movements, it can definitely make your head spin. So as you've seen, we've done a lot of tests around complex camera movements, like camera mapping with the background from the teaser you saw. Uh, we also explored creating hybrid sets. This idea of expanding the possibilities for staging was really there from the very beginning. But for AWILAN, we realized that despite all, all these new possibilities, uh, we were primarily 2D artists, and the cinematic language of our directors and storyboard artists is fundamentally rooted, rooted in 2D. So we had to stay true to that DNA and build our workflow primarily in, in 2D. 
So what we've developed in Blender's 3D environment resembles more of a multi-plane camera setup like Disney's rather than a true 3D set. All the 2D elements are perfectly parallel to the camera. The camera never shifts its axis. We just focus on what we do best, uh, drawing. So only in exceptional cases, when we're trying to save production time, we will try to mix with 3D and hybridization. With uh, like eight times 26 minutes of animation to produce, sometimes keeping it simple is just the way to go. So layout. Um, in 2D animation in France, the term layout has always been a bit vague, especially in TV series. This department tended to disappear as we try to save time by creating backgrounds and char characters in, in parallel directly from the animatic. It required a lot of projection and we, we would not really realize the final result during compositing. It relies heavily on the director's vision in the meantime, hoping he won't forget anything. So once in compositing, we often discover the host of small issues, missing piece of background, forgotten cuts to make the animation interact with the set. There were also times we had to scrap elements entirely, uh, applying a heavy blur to a detailed background that took days to paint, or uh, cutting off animation that went off screen. So our initial idea was that all this work that ended up in compositing was in fact layout tasks, and that these staging problems were being addressed at the wrong time. So here the layout department draws background and characters and is responsible for camera placement, depth of field control, proper cut of the background and parallax. Therefore, it's essential to validate all these aspects as thoroughly as possible before moving further into production. Once all these choices are made, we embark on a um, huge technical phase aimed at preparing and de delineating the rest of the production process. To illustrate that, for painting of the background, which is done in Photoshop, here's how we use these strong layouts to connect everything. So we do project the camera frame on the exit plane of each grease pencil object in the layout. We make calculation to generate a PSD file at the correct resolution with some margin and well structured. This Photoshop file is then linked to a control scene in Blender using an option that constantly updates PNGs for each layer set, allowing for back and forth work between the painting and the different shots that use it. So here I make silly drawing on the tree and back in Blender just clipping refresh and I see the background is updated on this shot but also in the other shots that are using the, the same background. Here, just behind the, the monster and in the down left corner. So this way, we starting from a solid layout, we can have an assembly of uh, each shot at all times with the most up-to-date sources, providing almost a real-time view of the project progress. And I must say, it's really enjoyable. So here you see the layout, we update the background painting, but the order can be different. We can first make the animation on the layout, then update the, the background. The drawing tools. So to make life easier for the artist, we developed uh, numerous small drawing tools, often quite simple. They aim to provide something familiar so as not to disorient artists used to different workflows, or to streamline the process by automating repetitive tasks. So I won't go through all of them one by one, but uh, here's a few examples. There is that uh, simple quick edit tools allows for easy transformation of a drawing, along with the lattice deform tools that enables a more flexible adjustments. Uh, there's the reshape tool on knife paint, which help avoid, uh, help avoid peeling up multiple strokes by letting you continue editing the same one, keeping or adjusting the number of points of the stroke as needed. We also have a perspective grid tool for building backgrounds, just helping you draw your perspective and um, a reordering tool for objects that let you move them in depth without affecting the final appearance, organizing your objects like you will stack layers. Uh, 
And again, a new version of the onion skin with features like uh, shift and trace, a uh, world view that takes uh, object level transformation into account, and even a camera view, um, which um, shows the exact placement of previous frames on the screen. Because when the camera moves, the world space is just, just force. Then cut out animation. So it's the biggest part. Uh, 2D cut out animation with rig character is often essential in TV series production. Maintaining model consistency, reusing poses or part of poses, working in direct color and automating the creation of in-betweens. All these elements speed up the production process and need to exist within Blender, but it's a big challenge. So when I first started uh, looking into it, there weren't very many references available. There were some rigs using armatures and some stylized head, head turns, but uh, the setup were often complicated and more about rigging poses rather than full rotations. And despite all the good ideas within it, uh, I wasn't really convinced for something of this scale. Well, in 2D rigging, especially in Harmony, I feel like there are two main schools of thought, the redraw team and the deformer team. So I'm not against deformer, they are, really, they are really powerful for in-betweening, but you never draw, and it's a bit sad. And from experience, I know that redrawing adds a subtlety and less mechanical feel, sometimes just as quickly. So one of my big requirements was to make sure that at any point you could just select um, an element, redraw it, just as simple as that. Having that and assuming that Blender's sculpt tool can act pretty much like a deformer would do, we would even have the sort of deformer option too, so like best of both worlds. Blender's armatures are really powerful, but using them like 3D does quickly undermines the ability to redraw freely and even might require a long process of weight painting for every new drawing. So it complicates the simple process of uh, selecting an element and editing it, redrawing, moving, anyway. We already have to switch modes constantly and the pose mode became a hurdle and we needed something more fluid without going through so many steps for such simple action. The other requirement was the ability to animate the order of elements in depth, like moving an element in front or behind another and animate that. Something that a traditional layer stack doesn't easily allow. There are tools to shift layers, uh, parent them to objects, to bones, but there were still many bugs in 3.6 and it made things quite complicated. We would end up... What? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> It will come. It's a bit long, but it will come. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, having like 200 layers in a, um, in a grease pencil objects make things really complicated. So not enough visual organization. So the idea that came out, all of this, was to use multiple objects, one for each physical element. And inside each object, layers will be separated uh, based on logical graphic structure like line in front of color. And the location in depth of the object will allow us to smoothly animate the hand in front uh, or behind the body. So uh, here are a video that shows early tests of the technique. So back then we started uh, creating three shots without a proper rig in place, but rather rigging only the necessary poses. I did the first shot myself based on the director's drawing. I could break my character into a relatively small number of objects, set up the key poses, then generate automatic in-betweens. And finally, I imported the mouse shapes from an external file, testing the early stages of GP cutouts of our pose manager, which we'll talk about soon. I think we'll see the final result soon. Yeah, here are the mouse shapes. For the next two shots, I only prepared the first pose and handed them off to another animator. It was the real beginning of sharing this workflow. 
getting her feedback on ergonomics and of the process and her expectations for cut out animation software. So at this point, her feedback uh, weren't good at all. She was largely right. Uh, we were still far from meeting the level of expectation needed to really get animators on board. So there was still a lot of work to be done to make animation workflow smoother. And even today, we are continuing to improve it. I'll grab a search chart. Making that run cycle and just moving. So just before diving into the rigs to really understand the value of using puppets, I wanted to quickly show a tool that we call AutoTwin, which generates in between based on key poses. It's pretty common. I see that logic through every animation software since I started animating with Cutout. So natively, Blender allows us to interpolate grease pencil frames, but um, if the grease pencil object itself is also animated, the interpolation doesn't take that into account. So we have to do some manual adjustments to get the desired in-between. The in-between add-on we did not only interpolates the grease pencil frames, the algorithm is a bit different, but um, it also interpolates every F curves within the objects, and depending on the preferences, it acts on, on every child of the active object. Additionally, we have uh, an option to manually input the spacing for the in-betweens, which is helpful because animators often, often already know the spacing, the specific spacing they are, they are aiming for based on the animation style they are working on. When the drawings are too different and the interpolation would inevitably give unsatisfactory results, uh, we introduce the concept of clipping. Instead of distorting the image, the feature simply chooses the, the closest one. So when the drawing so once the key poses are set, if we've organized things well, Auto Twins, while not perfect, can save a lot of time and works very well with sculpt adjustments. This is one of the key advantages of this technique over traditional animation. So in between and no ink and paint, you work already in color. Well. So after hiring two different riggers, Rodolphe Coutinho, a 3D rigger, and Benjamin Lafay, uh, who comes from 2D rigging, making something like 100 versions of the first rigs we had to create to arrive um, at what later served as the template for all the characters. We took it apart and reassembled it a large number of times to ensure we understood everything. And at the same time, we developed tools to create characters relatively quickly, a big rig toolbox with plenty of buttons that I won't show you today, as well as tools to manipulate these rigs easily afterwards. So here's what it looked like. This is the model sheet created in Blender as well, from which we will build the rig. We also prepare all the necessary materials, which will be centralized in a separate file, along with palettes using the color picker add-on developed by Amélie Fondevilla at uh, Studio Effet Special. Then we split our character in about 60 elements parented together, which can be manipulated in object mode, primarily in FK. A small operator allows them to move along the depth axis, making a body part appear in front of the others. There are a few selection helpers, face, hair, eyes, um, pupils. There is also a 2D IK system for the limbs, which uses an armature but that is manipulated in object mode. A small script allows switching from one to the other while maintaining the pose exactly as it is. Same for a free mode from limb's extremities, disconnecting the end from the arm without affecting its position. Okay. You can also show high controllers, adjust line thickness, some different things. Most of that is built using drivers, modifiers, effects, and constraints in, in a very standard way. So we then construct a whole series of poses for, by precisely following the model sheet, including the complete turn, mouse shapes, expressions, and head orientations. 
the designers make one final pass in the file to make small correction, resulting in validated rig files like you saw. To then use these poses and import them into the animation scene, since the asset browser has just been released and it was the perfect interface for selecting and importing a pose or animation. The 3D pose library was kind of exactly what we had wanted. The main problem was that our form of animation, combination of object transformations and grease pencil drawings wasn't recognized as a valid asset. And accessing external pose library risked to offering too low performance. But um, we were determined and we found workarounds. So we created GP Cutout with the help of Sophie Noeri at the beginning and later on with a ton of work from Julien Dator. So there's a custom operator to create assets. The add-on uses actions in empties just for thumbnail generation and adding custom data to these actions, holding the frame range, the asset type and so on. And then you can access them from another file with the asset brother and trigger the custom importer. So here I will just import my character. Um, so missing objects are created on the first import. The relationships are reproduced exactly. The template scene is fully linked into my file, meaning it's entirely loaded into the RAM. And it's, it allows me to quickly access the object, their position, their drawings, and I can import poses, animation, or even what you see is master controllers. So a master controller is a collection of poses that can be navigated through a modal operator, depending on the position of the mouse. It will load a specific pose from the template scene. You can also import part of poses with the same logic. Uh, by default, depending on the selected objects, we only import onto the children of, the, of that object. This allows for composing pose from the top of the hierarchy to down to the extremities, which is very convenient. We can so also use the mouse position in both axes, for example, to orient the head. And finally, by holding the shift key, we can interpolate between poses with the same logic as auto twins to try to achieve a smooth turn. So we create assets for every characters or even props and animators can share poses or animation within the library. So of course, achieving perfectly fluid turns take a consider considerable amount of time. I'll spare you all the complexities uh, that it involves, but Sometime we started feeling that we were mimicking 3D, which is not the point at all. So our rigs are not always perfect at this level. We don't really have time to push it to that extent, considering the realism required by the artistic direction of the project. Um, one interesting concept that we set aside during the development process was uh, the idea of frame instances, where our drawing could be reused multiple times within a shot for a cycle, for example, and modifying one instance will impact all the others. So we would have loved that. We tried several tests with the time offset modifier to call drawing from another place of the timeline. However, this proved to be cumbersome and complicated. It complicated the redrawing process. So we accepted that each frame will be unique and a full copy of another. But we definitely look forward to this type of feature that will simplify the process a lot. Another important feature that I felt was still missing in Blender, uh, at least for this technique, was masking between, ob between objects. Natively in 3.6, you can mask one layer by, by another, but only within the same object. While we can attempt to create overlapping masks using the mask stack, the logic isn't fully developed yet and we quickly found ourselves limited. So with such small cutouts of characters, we would soon encounter elements that should be masked by several others, such as shadows, reflections, and fabric patterns. So to avoid spending too much time perfecting match lines everywhere, we needed a masking solution. So GP mask is really more of a workaround, almost a hack. It was pretty unstable at the beginning because and Python is really slow to manage things in real time. So we consolidated uh, it a lot and it started to hold up, but 
It's just better than nothing. So the add-on allows us to generate a layer from another object. Here we create a layer in the arm object that comes from the forearm. Uh, we can perform a Boolean operation between layers, such as uh, subtracting the line from the color. And the generated layer is placed in the plane of the arm and positioned to match the forearm exactly from the camera's perspective. We can finally use it as classic mass to attempt to create uh, complex joints. On Ewilan, we have limited its use to a minimum, so we only use it for through reflection and cast shadows. I have to say these masks are, are far from perfect. They hinder selection, are computationally expensive and not real time. However, they provide a direction for how we could uh, further enhance the possibilities, allowing for automatic patches or even more complex assemblies of 2D pieces. Well, although most shots are completely designed in 2D, in some cases we resorted to 2D, 3D hybridization. This can indeed save production time, but it can quickly complicate the pipeline. So here are briefly a few, a few use cases we encountered on Ewilan. First, we use it as a drawing help for recurring props uh, or those particularly complicated to draw, like listing, which is horrible to draw. For certain creatures, like uh, the workers, uh, we even use a real 3D rig. Since the spider-like legs are complex to animate, it was beneficial to be able to reuse them from different angles. Here, we quickly mask collision to clean the shot before compositing. And lastly, the horses, which are numerous in this series, present uh, the most complex case as they interact directly with the 2D characters. So here we see the horse animation. There's a perspective adjustment tool here, like a giant lattice that corrects the difference of um, focal lengths. We then use a large holdout of planes uh, to cut the horse into different layers. And we render each layer and project it, project it from the camera onto planes. This allow, allows us to interleave the puppet elements with those on the horse, of the horse. And additionally, since video textures are computationally expensive, we have two different rendering qualities to maintain playback at the right speed. To conclude this journey through our workflow, um, here is the render nodes module, which allows us to quickly prepare renders and serve as a bridge to Fusion. This development of our Blender's custom nodes was done in collaboration with the studio Lefe Special, mostly Damien Picard, and is actively developed by Pierre et Tev at uh, Andartan. So its main idea is to extend the rendering logic, save time in setup, and enable us to render everything in one go. So, Take a look. So these nodes, uh, they represent view layers, uh, so we can easily display them. They are marked uh, as read-only because they are automatically edited based on the node tree when we click on the update button. Uh, here are various examples of elements to isolate, including objects or even materials. Or collection. Why not? And these view layers are then linked uh, to one or more render states, which centralize rendering parameters, uh, output definitions, format, and, and even more. Uh, okay. We also have that small library of nodes, as well as the ability to save presets and node groups making it easy to retrieve them from one thing to another. Finally, we can render all of our view, layer, view layers, or only the active ones, uh, and then properly import everything into Fusion and start compositing. Oh. Okay, here's the node group preset.
And then, yeah, we do, I have the same mask into fusion. Here we are, nearing the end of the presentation. Um, I would like to thank and encourage everyone who's involved in the production of this show and actually make it. The directors, F. Ciccarelli, Justine Mettler, and Fabien Daffy. Also, production team, uh, leads, artists that make this project look very good. I can them them all, but uh, also the tech team, partners, and so on. And then thanking you for being there, really thank you. One last thing before leaving, I'd like to share um, with you a short edit of uh, some work in progress scenes from the series, uh, which was recently showcased at MIP in Cannes. So, and then if we have time left, and if you have any questions, I can try to answer them. Thank you. <gasps> oh, il faut vraiment que je dorme. Mais salut toi D'où est-ce que tu viens Mais... Non mais attends, reviens Là, derrière ce bosquet, pourtant, pas possible. Ça. Oh, bonjour, damoiselle. Êtes-vous égaré Pardon euh, je... Mais oui, cela ne fait aucun doute. Vous êtes perdu. Laissez-moi vous aider. Je me présente, Bjorn Will Wyard, chevalier en quête de, en quête de quête. Pour vous servir. few minutes left, so if anyone has any question, I'll be happy to answer it. Yes? Please. Can you just take your mic? It's, it's very short. I was wondering how um, uh, smear frames would be handled in this workflow, if it's manual adjustment or actually stretching the rigs and, and stuff like that, or, or if it's not a part of the style at all. I mean, Everything is drawn, so smears are just like regular drawings uh, like the others. Mm -hmm. You can both sculpt things or just redraw it. Okay. Anyone else? There? Oh. Could you... Okay, could someone just pass the mic? <laughs> I figure we're using the mics for the recordings, so... 
I could yell, but instead I'll just talk. Um, with your stroke interpolation technique, what was the upper limit of strokes before that started to break down a bit? We talk about um, the interpolation. Right. Yeah, we, we do need to have the same amount of strokes and the same color of each stroke numbered in like the order. So it's a bit complex. We just thought when we compare two frames, we just have three states, like it's the same frame, it's just a full copy, or it's a complete different frame, like they don't have the same number of strokes or points. And then it, there are sculpted frames, which have the same number of points and the same amount of strokes. And so then we can interpolate those, those frames. Very cool. I'll pass this off, who's next? <laughs> it's a great presentation. It's okay, over there. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was just uh, wondering, uh, I was t t totally startled by the model sheets that you showed. And I was wondering, um, th do you have to do these uh, super intricate model sheets every time from scratch for every character? Or are the, uh, how, how, uh, how long does it take for you to make a, a model sheet for one character? So it really depends on the um number of times the character appears in the show. So we have like main pack characters that takes the most, the most uh, time. Um, I could say it's like three or four days for design only, then almost uh, two weeks for rigging. And for more casual characters, it's really less. We don't design all the mouse shapes and everything. So it goes down to like, three days for rigging and maybe two for, for design. Thank you. Welcome. No more questions? <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit fast and a bit dense, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, because I uh, working in the grease pencil and interesting me your pattern to interpolation, uh, different angle, the face, the uh, poses, and remember me, uh, it's a pattern what you use is some add-ons or different S and uh, used to your animation? Yes, yeah, this is uh, an add-on used for in between. So um, it's pretty simple add-on that just interpolates all the, um, the curves you will find on the objects, even custom properties and so on. Does this answer to your question? Or? Uh, uh, what is the name of this add-on? Uh, it's called uh, In-Betweens, In simply. <laughs> it's okay. on the same <laughs> yeah, It's simple. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe just a follow-up question. All the tools, <laughs> wait, you had the same question probably? Okay, uh, all the tools that you developed, where you said they're open source, so yes. can people download them from your website or? You can check the GitLab uh, page. Oh, they're all there, I okay. I can try to show you again. Where is it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But uh, like I said, uh, it won't work in Blender 4, mostly, most of them would just work with the older version of Grease Pencil. We didn't try it, and so to make sure it works, you have to stick on 3.6. Thank you. Oh, this is hard, okay. <laughs> Uh, congratulations, it looks amazing. Um, I was just wondering about uh, compositing. So obviously for this, you're working in Fusion. Yeah. And I was just wondering, is that a human question of just people are more comfortable with Fusion? Or is it a software thing? And if it is a software thing, what is lacking in Blender that you would like to be able to do all your compositing in one place? So uh, compositing is not uh, the part I worked the most on, but uh, I asked the same question to my colleague, uh, why didn't we make this into Blender? So he answers me that there were too many technical limitations. He didn't feel that he could do everything he wanted. 
but uh, it's a series so we also have to go quick like uh, I think it's around eight shots a day so it's really fast so maybe we don't need that much uh, level of uh, compositing but that was the choice of the lead uh, compositor. Yeah, there. Do you have a question? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we we are done now. Thank you. <laughs>